All right, there you are now. You're welcome along this Monday morning to OTB AM. Dave McIntyre, the hardest working man in sports journalism, is here alongside me. <laughs> Good morning. What time did you get to bed last night, Dave? Two. Two? Yeah. Well, I think I fell asleep around two. I got to bed about one thirty. Who do you blame for the, uh, I mean, this is just the rock and roll lifestyle. You, you were out in Reynards <laughs> yeah. and it still existed. That was it, yeah. I went straight, well, from, straight from the dance floor to the studio this morning. I blame the utter incompetence of the ground staff at Manchester Airport. Yeah, just briefly night. explain what happened here, right? <laughs> just to make everybody uh, that little bit terrified about using international air travel. Yeah, um, we were supposed to fly from Manchester, I say we, myself and my fellow Aer Lingus passengers, at 9.40 last night. And just as we were preparing to board, we were actually almost down at the door. You know, where you, they've asked you to form yet another queue before you eventually get through the door right yeah. onto the tarmac. And we were told an hour and a half later, or it could have been that long, it seemed like we were standing there for an hour and a half, that we all had to go back to security and get rescanned. Everybody on the flight, because an inbound flight from Paris had arrived just as we were due to board, and some um, spanner working for Manchester ground staff uh, opened the wrong door. So you had a situation where you had inbound international passengers mixing with outbound domestic passengers, which apparently constitutes a major security breach. So we all had to go all the way back to security, take our liquids and everything and laptops all out again. And there were unfortunately, there were only two people in security at the time. So you had an entire flight of about, what, 200 people trying to get through. That took two hours. At least you know now what it's going to be like whenever Brexit happens, that uh, you're going to have to get scanned and scanned and scanned again because, you know, we're all different. Yeah, well, we'll take the positive. It's important to what's to come. Can't wait. Anyway, what's coming up on our show today? We have uh, loads of good stuff for you. You can see it right there. Right there, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Martin O'Neill to Everton is the uh, latest rumours that um, just won't die over the course of the weekend. He still tops the betting. Not that that makes that much of a difference when it comes to these markets, because obviously it's just a way of stealing your money. Uh, the back page, we'll run you through the um, back pages. No real consensus, uh, except in the UK newspapers, where it looks like um, one of their wicket keepers at the Ashes is in a bit of trouble for an alleged headbutt. We'll talk about the uh, November series and how successful or otherwise they've been from Joe Schmidt's perspective. Fiona Steve is going to join us just after 8 o'clock to talk to us about that. As well as that, we'll run you through what's going on in a very, very busy weekend of GAA. Um, unbelievable stuff from Schlock Neil. A uh, big win for Moorfield, big win for Lomans, and a big win for Nemo against uh, Croaks as well. So some great photographs and stories from that as well. And we'll talk football with Dave. As ever, if you want to get in touch with us, you can tweet us here at Off The Ball or you can leave a comment on the live stream on Facebook or YouTube. That's facebook.com forward slash off the ball or youtube.com forward slash off the ball as well. This Martin O'Neill to Everton story. Everton have obviously been on the hunt for Marco Silva. If you believe what has been printed, um, anything up to 20 million quid in terms of compensation that they are willing to offer for Marco Silva. I think technically Martin O'Neill is out of contract in that he hasn't signed his yeah. new deal, so you wonder if any compensation would have to change hands. So it's a much cheaper option. It's um, somebody that knows and understands exactly what the vagaries of the Premier League are. And it might just be somebody who comes in on a short-term deal, organises things, gets a bonus for keeping them up or whatever, and it might appeal to Martin O'Neill. It may well appeal to Martin O'Neill, but what substance is there to this story apart from the fact that his odds on becoming the Everton manager have been slashed? I mean, come on, don't be, don't be asking what substance there is to the story. <laughs> We've got an hour and a half every morning and three hours in the evenings to feel, <clears throat> but this, that's the whole point of this thing. Well, look, we live in a world where a couple of hefty bets on any particular 50 quid is probably enough to change it. Yeah, maybe not even necessarily yeah. hefty. It can be enough to bring the odds way down because it's almost like a run on the banks. Uh, some of the bookmakers just start to fear there might actually Did be Did you say there's been a run on the banks, Dave? <laughs> Don't worry, we're long before the gates are opening at, uh, at 9 o'clock. I would be very doubtful as to what substance is behind it. I, I'd be amazed if he is the choice of Everton to, to maybe not necessarily bring the forward in the, in the medium term, so they wanted, even in the short term. They wanted Marco Silva and they wanted Thomas Tuchel and Diego Simeone had to come out and go, I'm not going to Everton, what are you talking about? Uh, last week in a, in a statement, which was like, I'm definitely staying at Atletico for the end of my uh, contract and I'm definitely not joining Everton, which seemed like a random kind of dig at Everton for no apparent reason. Uh, so, you know, you start going down the list and like... It's exactly, say, say Martin O'Neill was to take the job in this hypothetical situation, who the hell do we get to manage Ireland? <laughs> well, see, that's a really different question, isn't it? I, I would go to one of the guys who should have been considered for the Everton job and probably 
would have now be Everton manager if they hadn't so publicly chased and court, courted Marco Silva. And that's Sam Allardyce. Because I think he's the perfect guy if you just do what West Ham have done with David Moyes. You're not quite sure where you want to go in the medium to long term. So you'd bring David Moyes in for the end of the season. To get your relegated. Exa- well, for West Ham are thinking to keep them up. Yeah. And you get a nice hefty bonus for keeping them in the Premier League. Then he can decide if he does manage to stay up and if they do it with a bit of style, he'll have a number of suitors. He can probably look a little bigger in terms of ambitions. West Ham can offer him a contract if they want him. I think Everton should have done that with Sam Allardyce. And they could still be doing that with Allardyce if they hadn't publicly gone after Marco Silva to the point where Silva in a press conference didn't deflect the question on his future and said, well, look, it's up to Watford and Everton to talk. Pretty much saying, I want the Everton job, so you guys get a deal done. And then Sam Allardyce, you think someone thinks- like Sean Dyche, suddenly publicly they're sloppy seconds and they're not interested. Th- uh, okay, what? Wh- I'm going to leave aside the use of the sloppy seconds. <laughs> Just for a second, right? <laughs> we'll come back to that maybe off air. <laughs> um, why does anybody care how you get the job when ultimately how you get the, how you get the job is irrelevant, it's how you do in the job. So if you're Sean Dyche, and you actually want that job. The fact that they wanted somebody else first, it doesn't matter because once they get you, they're stuck with you. They can't fail. Like, they're wedded. The next Everton manager has a, not a blank checkbook, but a lot of money to spend and the freedom to burn out whoever he wants from that squad, I think. And so if you're, you, you will have control regardless of whether or not Marco Silva was the first choice. I think to some like ego, Sam Allardyce it? it matters. Just ego. Yeah, I would. Now, I'm from what we've seen of Sean Dyche, he certainly doesn't come across a guy that is arrogant or has much of an ego in any way. Now, maybe if you got to get to know him, that might be different, but certainly outwardly, it doesn't appear to be the case. Sam, I think, has been around the block so often, and he's had big jobs, and he's been done out of big jobs in the past. We know what happened to him with England. I think he would have taken the fact that he wasn't their first choice quite personally, having publicly declared his interest in taking the job. Yeah. So he, he was the first to mention the Everton job. Yes, it's something I'd be interested in speaking to them about. Next of all, he knows that Marco Silva is their man. I think that matters to someone like Sam Allardyce. I think he'd be a good uh, Everton manager. I think he'd be stands. the perfect fit. I do also think that Martin O'Neill is in with the shadow getting this job uh, from Everton's perspective. Well, I would say they're looking at what he's done with Ireland and think, OK, and they look back to his time at Villa. His time at Sunderland, I think, not that he gets a free pass on, but that ultimately he's recovered from that. And so it's not what everybody remembers. And everybody understands... Ella Short and Sunderland is a basket case. Look where they are now. Things haven't exactly improved for them. I think there's every chance that um, if this continues on into the middle of the week... The reason we're talking about this is because they were hammered at the weekend. They were hammered in Europe last week. Mm. Things have gone absolutely tits up from... Nine goals in two games. Yeah, so, like, is that squad so bad? It's... Look, we've said in the past that a squad is too good to go down, and we have seen teams go down, of which that has been said. So I don't think they're beyond relegation. Now, I think ultimately there will be three worse teams in the Premier League than Everton, but they have some very good players. They've got a lot of guys who are vastly underachieving, underperforming, and maybe in the short term, if the motivational skills of Martin O'Neill possesses are to be believed, he is the perfect guy to come in in the short term and get them through to the end of the season. And we've seen, say... Ultimately, what t- someone to turn out to be a really poor manager, Sunderland and Paolo Di Canio, the impact he had when he went in, because he comes in all guns blazing and suddenly he's able to get something out of the players. You get that bounce that you get usually from a new manager coming into the side. Yeah. But it's um, who do Ireland get? If if so, say <laughs> maybe say, it goes back to the same answer. Say Big Sam, Sam says, Say Big Sam says no to Ireland. Is there anybody else out there? Like that's the, for me the main issue about this whole let's get rid of Martin O'Neill momentum is that. There is no, there's no clear replacement. O'Neill knows that squad and has like built up a style of play that maybe if they don't go to the diamond, everything's a grass. <laughs> <You know? laughs> don't, don't do the diamond thing. Well, if you're going to do it, just maybe work on it a little before you actually take to the field. I can't see anybody outside of Brian Kerr who will not get the job. I would be amazed if he did and Mick the, McCarthy. The Saturday panel wanted Stephen Kenny. Eamon Dunphy wants Stephen Kenny. That, that would echo the kind of calls for Brian Kerr back after Mick got the sack in 2003. Was it early 2003 or late 2002 after we were beaten by the Russians and Swiss? Yeah. But, and I mean, it would be brilliant to see somebody like Stephen Kenny get the opportunity. It would be fantastic. And you know that there would be an incredible level of detail and prep put into the 
preparation of the team for the big games and that he would put his heart and soul into it, as any manager would once they get the job. But I would think if I had to list out a short list of favourites, Mick McCarthy would be at the top of it because I think his race is shortly to be run at Ipswich Town. Yeah, yeah. I, and even from his own personal point of view as well because he is just you know, going at 100 miles an hour just to try and stand still in that division. He's got no funds. He's keeping them up. I think levels of expectations of Portman Road would actually mirror what Mick McCarthy's producing for them. They're not trying to run him out of the place. And he's been there. Is he the longest service manager in the championship by distance? It must be. Um, so it's kind of assumed that the notion of a manager from Dundalk stepping up to the Republic of Ireland is ludicrous. That That's kind of the way that it gets... It, it doesn't really get treated seriously. Then you look at what Michael O'Neill has done and you think... Well, why the hell not? There's no reason. I don't think there's a real cogent argument as to why someone like Stephen Kenny could not do the Irish job successfully. There would have been if he hadn't had European success. It was like, well, you know, let's see you step up to a bigger stage. And then they step up to a bigger stage and they do really well and like the style That's of exactly play is great. With O'Neill. Yeah. With Michael O'Neill. And that was enough that that was really what they needed to see. It's not like they've gone to the Scottish Premier League and managed a mediocre team to finish fourth. Like, ultimately, how, how great an achievement is that anyway, you know? And, and he does have experience from Scotland as well. It's actually a well-rounded CV that Stephen Kenny has. Um, if I had to pick somebody, I would like to go to him. I would think it would just be a brilliant seal of approval, stamp approval for the, for the League of Ireland, and it would um, show that we're actually not that blinkered when it comes to a point new manager. You don't always have to look over across the water and see who's hanging around there that doesn't have a job and probably doesn't have a job for a reason. Yeah, and now it would be a chance for us to kind of revisit that whole notion of the uh, integration of the League of Ireland with uh, the football culture that Irish fans have and kind of remind everybody that it's worth trying to re-engage with the grassroots. A very difficult thing to do, but there was a, a picture of um, an Athlone player doing a somersault, having won, I think, the under-15 National League last night. It's the first uh, League of Ireland title for Athlone in four divisions. It's in one of the newspapers. Um, I apologise for not remembering. I think it might be the examiner. And y you just kind of realise that actually there are little green shoots of proper organisation happening at underage level that it might take 10 years for things to actually filter up but maybe you can accelerate that process by finding somebody from within the league to, to get involved. We asked you on Twitter if you'd be disappointed if Martin O'Neill left uh, no Republic of Ireland game until 2019 could Martin O'Neill be a stopgap says uh, Eamon Duggan uh, yes he's given us some great moments and overall has done a great job. I think the immediate anger of the 5-1 subsides and people go who do we get to replace him? Is Roy Keane the man? I mean, he'd, he'd be the obvious person in the first... He'd be the obvious person, right? Yeah, continuity. Is that the word we're looking for when if Roy Keane steps into Martin O'Neill's shoes? If Martin O'Neill, if Martin O'Neill goes, Keane will walk. He has no chance of managing Ireland yet, says Conor Collins. And if Martin O'Neill goes, does Roy Keane take over? Asks Kieran O'Dee. I suspect that maybe the... Maybe the FAI would look to appoint him because it's continuity and it's also box office and you can sell to your sponsors much easier Martin O'Neill than Stephen Kenny and ultimately a lot of this comes down to money. I don't know if the outcome is guaranteed to be any better. I don't think it is. It's very hard to know how Roy Keane would fare as the manager in his own right. But I guess all you're looking to use is the evidence, the body of evidence from his time as a club manager which was clearly mixed. Would Roy Keane be happy enough to just take them every three or four months and I don't know I'll, I'll, plus we don't really know what kind of a role he has within the setup. We're only hearing little trinkets from players about how great he is to have around and Martin O'Neill about how, what a great job he has done and he's, like, he's got more than he could ever have expected from him. Would he be a better manager for Ireland than Martin O'Neill? Again. And the the stopgap measure is a good point by one of our viewers there that there's no reason why he can't take the Everton job till May. Keep them up and then just come back to Ireland. Yeah. Absolutely no reason. Well, you'd like the next six months to be spent watching the younger players and meeting them and saying, look, you're part of my thoughts and this is what you need to do. The way that Joe Schmidt gives work on to players, no? Roy can do that, can't he? I suppose he could, actually. You know, There's definitely a way around this. All right, let's take you through the uh, newspapers. We're going to start, Dave, I think, with the Irish Examiner. Yeah, the Irish Examiner is... Are we waiting? We will. We, well, I don't have it to hand. Here we are now, yeah. Munster Marvels, big day for Nemo yesterday in Parky Rin. 16 provincial title for Nemo as Connolly makes weary croaks pace. The All-Ireland champions have been dethroned. Were there and Slough Nail have won the double treble 
and um, plenty more as well on the weekend's rugby and the looking back on the November internationals, which have been pretty successful from an Irish point of view. Yeah, my fault there. I didn't have the uh, Irish independent hand, but I do now. There you go. <laughs> it's uh, the beaming, beatific face of uh, Gooch. Time takes its toll on the great. Eamon Sweeney's written a love letter inside. Good night, sweet prince. He's basically retiring him. He's like, look, you're done, buddy. Uh, your time uh, centre stage is over. So that was that. Um, the FAI are confident of keeping Martin O'Neill as their back page story. And it turns out Ireland are going to play the All Blacks in the November series next year. Some suggestion of a potential fixture in Rotterdam, some potential f su suggestion that that might, fixture might not be in Ireland. I think that'll have to be clarified over the next day or two. Well, we don't beat them in Ireland, we only beat them away from home, don't we? It'd be nice to get an old uh, Viva game against the All Blacks a year out from the World Cup and beat them. The Irish Times next. Mixed bag has Schmidt looking for more. This is um, the fairly bloodless November internationals. Uh, three very easy wins. A weird atmosphere around the ground. We'll talk more with Fiona Steed a little bit later on about this. Conte worried about City's blistering start. This is the fact that the league, the Premier League title race is over. It's done and dusted. Talk more with Dave about that game. He was at it yesterday. Sounded like it was a bit of a belter. It was a brilliant game of football. Yeah, loved it from the, from start to finish. It was great. And we're going to go to the Times, the Irish edition. It's been an interesting weekend all round in terms of GAA and rugby, but it is rugby that they're leading with. Heaslip and Payne could soon return. Schmidt confident pair may feature in the Six Nations. And then Lukaku faces Derby band for petulant kicks. The Manchester Derby is on December 10th. That's a game you can hear live and off the ball, Jerry. There's that uh, photo I was talking about there. Yes. It's, um, it's the Times Ireland edition, obviously, with that. So, brilliant photograph. Um, I mean, that, that's type of athleticism. We could do it in the Ireland team, right? <laughs> We'd all be pretty happy to see a bit more of that. Uh, so, the, do you have the Daily Mail? I've got the Daily Mail. There you go. It's a Monday. We're not as organised as we should be, all right? <laughs> Kill us. Uh, here we go. To Zealand. There you know. Nothing, nothing like a good Monday morning pun. Schmidt tight-lipped on the prospect of a Kiwi doubleheader. So, actually, there you go. That was... Uh, there's potential for four games, and maybe it would be Ireland here against the All Blacks and then Ireland also in Rotterdam against the All Blacks. Yeah, which would mirror what happened last November and that would be pretty good if we could repeat that. It's all football on the back of the Irish Sun today. No pain, no gain. Pep glad to suffer. He's pretty much saying that they needed a game like the one they experienced against Huddersfield at the Kirkley Stadium yesterday just to bring them back down to earth a little and grind a win out in a way that they necessarily haven't had to do over the course of the season. Not to Celtic as well. Four in a roar. Brendan Rodgers picks up his fourth trophy in 18 months as Celtic manager. It's been a very good spell in charge at uh, Parkhead for the former Liverpool boss. Title wave is the uh, headline there. Huddersfield won Man City too. And then Frampton legal fight. Former world champion Carl Frampton looks out for a messy legal scrap after the McGuigan family launched proceedings against him. That uh, obviously is an unfortunate echo of the stuff that happened between Barney Eastwood and uh, Barry McGuigan decades ago. It was interesting that RT had to apologise to Barry McGuigan after um, some comments from Brawley and Dunphy. I wonder... Yeah. Uh, Des said it was because people had complained and phoned in. I wonder who were those people? <laughs> and how many of them were there? Yeah. And why is it always the case that Orty have to make the apology on behalf of these two guys, if it was Eamon Dunphy and Joe Brawley in this case? The apology never seems to come from the people themselves. Well, uh, maybe they shouldn't have to apologise. Like, you don't have to like everybody. Is it not fair game to say, I don't really like this person? It's a, very, it's a real light-hearted, you know, feel-good type of a TV programme and it, it is, probably just didn't need that element to it. Is it not just a listicle on TV? Is it not just BuzzFeed on TV like five years after BuzzFeed inbe invented lists on the internet? That's not far from it. It's not far from it, but... You may as well try and make it interesting, right? Yeah, but look, I mean, I can take as much probably, probably as any man because I just think he is box office and I love what he has to say. But to come out and just say, I just don't like the man when you're deciding whether or not his feet should be in the list of great sporting moments? Is it not like at least, here's, I, I have to tell you, I have to confess that I don't, I don't like this guy, so everything I say about it, you now know that I have this bias, and that's honest. Oh, it's absolutely honest. You As opposed to like, oh, he was great, it was brilliant, this thing happened back in the day, and wasn't it amazing, and it brought everybody together, like... But you could say the two, you can say, I don't like this guy, but his achievement was phenomenal. Yeah, I, I mean... I think it was his fakery around the whole, the pigeons of peace, the doves. Like, I don't know. I, I, I actually didn't see the piece. I just was reading the, um, I read about the apology and thought, Jesus, this is a bit weird, isn't it? Yeah. I wonder who was actually complaining to the point where they had to apologise. Because if it's five calls or a few texts and tweets, they're not apologising, are they? I don't know. Maybe they are. Well, how many does it take? What's the tipping point? Well, I think if maybe, you know, I don't know. 
I, I'd hate to speculate on. <laughs> I know many, many complaints it takes before. Or who, who actually? What's complained? our tipping point? How many complaints do we have to get? We need thousands of complaints. <laughs> <before>. <laughs> Let's move on to the Herald Sport. Pep's cold comfort again. He says uh, winter has come. Says Guardiola. As City, as City eke out a battling victory. O'Neill's still favoured for the Toffees as well. That's what we've been discussing over the last few minutes, that if you look at the bookmakers, a lot of them, they are still odds-on in terms of having Martin O'Neill as the next Everton manager. Blast Action Heroes. I'm going to lie, I haven't a clue. Oh, Last Action Hero. Okay, 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 I got it. Jesus. Yeah. It was the Bruce Willis movie. Arnold Schwarzenegger, no? Was he not the last action hero? Is it not like, oh, um, what's the, what's the one where it's about the uh, NFL and the NFL's gone to shit and a guy pulls out a gun in the middle of it and shoots somebody in the head? It's Bruce Willis film. <laughs> definitely not a movie I've seen. That is, you definitely would have seen it. Schwarzenegger was definitely the last action okay, hero. Okay, fair points. You've got me. You're, you're dead right. <laughs> Who's is that? Uh, that's Jamie Lee Curtis, is it? Yes. Ah, okay, right. Okay, yes. okay. I get it now. <laughs> Crappy reference from the mirror, so bad it is. No stopping City at the top. Pep hails champions display as Sterling snatches City's lucky late, late victory. There was a big debate in the office during the week about um, that video that did the rounds of uh, Pep showing Sterling how to square his hips to the right thing and do the one two and then cut with the goal that he scored midweek. And they're like, ah, oh, Pep's a genius. Adrian Barry, the refusenik, as ever, the contrarian was like, is there any possibility that maybe he wasn't actually talking about the same thing? That this is just like Pep being Pep on the on a completely different situation? There is about that possibility, but you can't get away from the fact that he has transformed him as a player. And particularly in front of goal. T 13, well yesterday was his 12th goal I think of the season. He's yeah. his top scorer. Now, albeit yesterday's goal was very fortunate, but I think they deserve the little bit of luck they created for themselves towards the end of the game because they've been so good prior to that. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. Uh, any any discussion that Raheem certainly has taken into account that he's been completely revolutionised. Yeah, he's in brilliant in front of goal at the moment. The uh, Racing Post, the back of the Racing Post today, Bees can produce their A game in Derby Clash. I'm not quite sure we're all going to be glued to this tonight. QPR against Brentford. Um, Woohoo! <laughs> it's the big championship match of the, uh, uh, of the day, so uh, let's celebrate that for better. All right, let's move on to the rugby. We're going to get the thoughts of Fiona Steed in a moment. Uh, Adam Byrne uh, got the full 80 minutes, started on the wing, finished in the centre, and afterwards caught up with Oshin Langan. Adam, congratulations on a fantastic debut. Run us through a magnificent week for you from when you were told right through to the end of that game and the fantastic win over Argentina. Yeah, it was incredible, you know. Um, yeah, I always have to be ready to play, but maybe I thought, uh, you know, maybe my chance had gone, but I kept the head down and I came in on Monday and, um, you know, it's hard to tell if you're going to be involved, but Monday night I was kind of like, oh, you know, maybe and kind of let myself uh, dream a bit, didn't get too good of a sleep, but uh, when the team was announced on Tuesday, it was surreal and, you know, it was incredible and telling my parents and stuff and they were obviously delighted. So then we had Wednesday was the day off and, you know, I kind of settled down. I had my head in a good space. But once the team was announced on Thursday, I got some really, really nice messages from, uh, you know, a lot of people. And, you know, it was obviously emotional, but, um, you know, I tried to keep my head in a good space and, you know, it's just been incredible. You know, I've tried to make sure I knew my detail and I just wanted to, you know, fit in. I didn't want to... I didn't want to sit back, you know, I wanted to kind of, you know, try obviously add to the team and, um, you know, it was just incredible from leaving the Shelburne today and seeing the support and even just seeing the support throughout the week, it, it was really special and, yeah, it was quite emotional, but, uh, you know, it was a great day. What were the conversations that Joe had with you this week and even in the lead up to this week when he would have spoken to you previously? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think there was, you know... Like I said, like I've said, uh, he, he's been he's been really good. You know, he's just treated me like anyone else and expected me to know my stuff. And you know, I like that he hasn't, you know, didn't go easy on me or, you know, he give out to me if I did something wrong or same as he would to anyone else. And you know, he'd obviously say well done if I did something good. So um, yeah, it's been it's been great. Yeah, that's one of the stories of the November Internationals, uh, not just Adam Byrne, obviously, but a bunch of players who have come through and got that experience now of uh, what the match day is like, being involved, being picked, uh, being told you're not being picked, leaving the Shelburne, getting in your suit, doing that whole thing and just being part of the squad that you don't have to go through it now in the Six Nations and so there's a lot less pressure on them. Fiona Steed is with us this morning. Good morning to you, Fiona. Morning guys, how are you? And um, before we talk about the November Internationals, we should talk about Joy Neville, who was named uh, World Rugby Referee of the Year, a former teammate of yours. 
Oh yeah, I'm so delighted. I was really crying last night, which is a, which is a big thing, you know, looking at it on the on the world rugby feed. Um, she's worked so hard, you know, to get to where she is, and completely there on merit, and is, is such a trailblazer. I'm I'm delighted for her and her family, and she's just such a down to earth person when it comes to it all. Yeah, who would have thought all those years ago when we were ploughing the fields together in Kuna out in Shannon, you know, that she'd have ended up with this. But it's brilliant. Tell us a little bit about um, how she managed to rise so quickly because generally you kind of feel like uh, it's going to take a number of years. Obviously having a background in playing really helps. Oh, I think it does and her fitness levels would have been, you know, would have been huge anyway and I think she went straight sort of in 2013 with the Munster Association of Referees into that, into refereeing. I think you have to have knowledge of the game and you have to have fitness and then you have to have the composure to actually, you know, referee at the top level. And she worked her way through the, the All-Ireland League structure, you know, with the, with the, with the men's teams and then on to, um, you know, on to bigger things, doing the British and Irish Cup. Um, a few of those games, and um, then progressing up to obviously, you know, the women's matches with the with the Six Nations, and then it, you know the World Cup final, which she was fantastic. You know, she was fantastic at, and then you know running AR with um, some of the the Pro 12 stroke Pro 14 um, from there. But it's down to her hard work and dedication, and I suppose the IRFU have put a lot of time and effort into their referees as well. I mean, look at Frank Murphy, who's come through after playing, and he's, you know, he's on that ladder as well, and um, Johnny Lacey and, and the likes of that. So, I mean, credit has to go to them as well for the support that they've given Joy um, over the last few years. Yeah, I, 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 I'm kind of, I don't know if I should bring this up or not, but um, Patrick O'Donovan, when he was the Minister for Sports, wanted a quota system for the number of women on boards in the big sports organisations, particularly the IRFU, the FAI and the GAA, and he threatened to withhold funding if they didn't actually meet those criteria. The IRFU were very strong in saying that uh, they just don't have enough women who are qualified at the moment and there's not enough women in the system. It seems to me that if you put some money in and invest and give people support, they can rise to the top really quickly because ultimately these jobs, particularly the board jobs that we're talking about, aren't that difficult. And here's Joy Neville proving that she can be the best in the world really quickly despite all the obstacles in her way. So, it, you know, maybe this whole notion of, um, of not being able to find enough women to be on the boards is a bit ridiculous. Oh, I think there's a few of us out there that would be um, more than capable, shall we say, of um, of doing those sort of jobs. And I think what World Rugby have done in the last week with Bill Beaumont coming out and just, you know, taking that option, I suppose, to another level in terms of, right, we're giving you 35% more places on the World Rugby board, but they have to be women. So that's huge, you know, and that sort of sets the mark from, I suppose, World Rugby's standpoint as to where they are. And, you know, hopefully the IRFU will will follow suit, you know, but I don't want that to take away from... No, of course, that's why I didn't want to bring it up, night. yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, you know, it's a, it's a point, I suppose, maybe for another day, but I think Joy is totally where she is on merit and, um, you know... She, next um, next month now when she does referee the, the European game as well. You know, that's just great. And she's just working really, really hard. You know, it's it's not easy to maintain your fitness at any level and she's having to work very hard with it. I know the scrutiny that she goes under. I mean, I spoke to her um, around the time of the Women's World Cup um, and, you know, the scrutiny that they go under in terms of every piece of their, you know, their match, their decision is actually up there, you know, for them to view. It's all scrutinised by people as well, every decision. So that's huge and that's a certain amount of pressure. But, you know, she was always so focused anyway on what she could do and what she could achieve. Um, so this is just taking it to another level. But you know what? It shows the pathway, though, that's there for women and girls after they've played that there is roles for them. Um, so whether it's in coaching, you know, we have Laura Guest at Munster now who's, you know, who's coaching the Munster women's team and um, this year. I would have done that myself as well in the past. And, you know, that there is, you can go coaching, refereeing or the admin role. And I think Mary Quinn with the IRFU, you know, she's their first um, woman on the on the RFU committee. And, you know, she's paving a way as well in, in different ways. You look at what Sue Carty achieved as well with the with the International Rugby Board as it was at the time. So, like, I wouldn't say that we're that far behind getting where we, we need to be. We just need to keep pushing on. OK, I just want to play you a clip here. We've got, um, we're going to move on to the, the games of the weekend. We had our Aviva, Aviva fan studio. Neve Briggs, Mike McCarthy and Andrew Trimble were all involved in this. And obviously the big issue that everybody wanted to talk about, uh, and unfortunately for uh, Andrew Trimble, we ended up talking about Jacob Stockdale. <laughs> yeah. 
Talk to us particularly about uh, Jacob Stockdale. We got a bit of a look at him obviously last week. You're, I'm sure, uh, more experienced in looking at him uh, close up. What's the uh, talk to us about him and what he, what he brings yeah, to Yeah, un- un- unfortunately. Awkward. Yeah. <laughs> un- <laughs> unfortunately, he's playing out of his skin at the minute. Um, there's a lot of competition up north, there's a lot of wingers playing well. He's playing unbelievably well. Everything he touches turns to gold at the minute. And you did score that try last night, though. I did, you? though, so <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about me again. Uh, he's going well. Adam Burns going well. Um, Chris Farrell's another one. Um, he's going really well. He's not as young as those fellas. He spent a bit of time round about getting there. But, um, yeah, there's a lot of guys there, and it's, it's interesting to see, as, as Big Daddy says, there's a bit more strength and depth now. Guys can step up and, and, and fill the shoes of the guys who are getting injured or, or maybe losing out in selection, and uh, it's nice to see. Is it? <laughs> Not for me. <laughs> it's nice to see for everyone else. Yeah, pain in the ass. I'm assuming that you're seeing these guys getting opportunities like, like uh, Jacob tonight. Yeah, your words, not mine. But I would <laughs> but agree with. I would agree with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, this one, right? It's uh, not so cryptic. We want to talk a little bit about to take on that point about the Jacob Stockdales and the other uh, players that are coming through here from a from a World Cup point of view, particularly on the back line. Need there's some really exciting prospects there. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think. We're finally getting some really brilliant players. I think Jacob Stockdale has been absolutely brilliant this season. Um, I've never realised how tall he was until I actually stood beside him. He's an absolute monster. He's um, I, this lad. Um, he's, well, <laughs> he's, he's, he's only one big daddy, but um, uh, no, he's he's really and he's so nimble and agile for yeah. for such a big lad. Um, so he's really exciting. I think Adam Burns um, hugely exciting going forward. I think he's a really good prospect. I've watched him last year on Seven Circuit, and he was absolutely brilliant and ripping it up there against some really quality opposition. So going forward, yeah, I I, I would be a little bit nervous of him defensively but I think that the month he's had in under Joe I think the players that he would have trained with over the last three or four weeks would have stood to him in huge stead and you know Joe said this week the reason why he's out there today is because he's trained really really well he's worked really really hard he's obviously fixed the things that needed to be fixed because um, he wouldn't be playing otherwise he's obviously you know he's earned this cap and um, and no better test against some really quality opposition Fiona the uh, the Notion that every young player who comes into the team is suspect defensively seems to just go out there. So obviously the uh, Pumas kicked every restart, it seemed to me, to Stockdale at the weekend. They clearly had that notion as well. He seemed to deal okay with us. Oh, look, he was. He's really, really impressive. You know, he, he definitely. And, you know, you, you look at, you know, Keith Earls, who was probably sitting at home watching that, having similar thoughts to Andrew Trimble, you know, because if he hadn't have pulled up injured, you wondered, would both of those lads have got the, the chance in the first place? And fair play to um, to Stockdale. He's, he certainly has taken his chance and he's certainly a prospect. And it'll be interesting to see, should everybody be fit um, come Six Nations time, will he retain that place? I mean, on that showing, he, he certainly you know you couldn't really fault him and um, Adam Byrne I suppose as they often say the ball didn't necessarily run his way you know he perhaps didn't get as many chances saying that Stockdale did come in off his wing a little bit better and sort of chase the ball more especially for that um, you know that that try when um, Farrell's beautiful hands to you know to um, Johnny Sexton you know, so it's, it's great you know just a quick word on Chris Farrell. Uh, Razi Rasmus did a thing recently with um, Stephen Ferris just before he left for South Africa and I was chatting to Ferris afterwards and he was like, I was asking about Farrell, you know, and how good he is because obviously the Ulster lads would all have a natural interest in him. And Razi predicted that Farrell will start for Ireland in the World Cup <coughs> against South Africa. Now obviously, we've got to get through Scotland. Yeah. Um, maybe we both finish second in our group, I don't know. But, um, or maybe they finished first and we finished second and not taken too much for granted. But I thought that was really interesting. That was three weeks ago before everybody that had kind of caught up with the Chris Farrell hype. Well, that's it. And I mean, his sleight of hand for that try that I just mentioned, I didn't know that that was in him, if you know what I mean. You know, not seeing him in training every day as, as Razzie Erasmus would have done. And um, so, so that's great and for him to get the chance as well, um, you know, to, to play the, the second match and to play alongside Bundiaki, um, which is which is fantastic. And it just shows that we have such depth around the, the three-quarter line and the, the back three as well. So, you know, fair play, I suppose, looking at, you know, when Henshaw comes back in, when Gary Ringrose comes back in, you know, it's a really good place um, to be as, a, as an Ireland fan and an Ireland supporter. And it's a, probably a welcome headache for, for Joe Schmidt around there. Fiona, there's been over 40 players capped by Joe Schmidt since he took over in 13, which is quite incredible over a four-year span. And we didn't have the fireworks of back-to-back games against the All Blacks and the Australians as we did a year ago. But I just wonder, 
maybe di at this stage of a World Cup cycle when he does have to start looking at new faces, that taking on Argentina, a fairly weak South Africa and a Fiji side, it ultimately in hindsight, maybe looking back in two years' time, it might have been just the perfect blend and the perfect mix that we needed in this November, given what looks like we've got out of it. Well, that's it. I mean, it did give the chance. I mean, the I was up there with you in the Aviva for the Fiji match, and it got it got a little bit squeaky bum time, you know, in the in the second half, and you were sort of going, God, you know, if they'd lost that, then you would have said, right, this experiment with all of these, you know, the thirteen changes and with all of these young players, you would have so, sort of said, right, you know, was it a gamble? But it it paid off, and they certainly learned how to, you know, dig out a, you know, dig out a win. So so probably yeah, because he probably. It, if it had been last year's trio in the Autumn Internationals, he certainly wouldn't have given that many new players. You know, Porter wouldn't have got his start at prop. Um, you'd wonder, would James Ryan, you know, Ulton Delan, would they have got as the game time that they did get? So, so great. But for me now, he needs to sort of play some of these in the big matches that matter in terms of the Six Nations and he needs to, um, I'm sure he'd be delighted with my my opinions, but, you know, he needs to look at, um, you know, Johnny Sexton out and out, number one, um, number 10, shall we say. But if he got injured in the first game of the Six Nations, who's he going to depend um, on then? You know, and I don't think we quite know that yet. It's Tyler Blaindell, really, isn't it? And that's what he, Blaindell has to step up and have a good couple of months here to play himself in to be the second choice, number 10, with... Joey Carby is that floater in case his form is better than Blaine Dalles and he's the second choice number 10, but who then can also automatically be on the bench as your sub fullback, sub centre if needs be, and sub out half. Well, that's it. That's what you'd sort of think. I mean, Blaine needs to get fit, obviously, first, you know, and recover and then get a, a run of games coming into the Six Nations. Um, like, is he eligible just before the Six Nations start? But he's obviously been in camp. Um, previously as well I mean it was interesting speaking to Stuart Lancaster up there and you know they had plans for Carberry and that in these run of matches to give him the time at 10 and now that's scuppered so it just shows you know injury is such a fine line isn't it from from starting to you know not getting your chance and not getting your chance to perform so that's you know that there is options there, certainly. Um, and in, in fairness to Ian Keatley, like came on against Fiji and, you know, steered the ship home. You'd wonder, could he have given him more time, you know, um, at the weekend just to see what he could do under that sort of, of pressure? But I suppose, you know, Argentina did come back really, really strongly in the second half. And, um, you know, Sexton, you know, saw it home then. Do you think, Fiona, that looking towards the Six Nations, with the way that the three home games are coming on after the first trip to Paris, that it's about time that we actually had took a Six Nations test with Jonathan Sexton fit and left him out of the team. So, as you say, there's only one way, if he retains his fitness, that we're going to find out whether these guys are going to be able to stand up to a World Cup quarterfinal, the way Ian Madigan had to come in against Argentina in Cardiff two years ago. So if it's Italy, for example, at home, or one of the Wales and Scotland games, on the assumption that we get a win in Paris, that you don't just go with Sexton, maybe leave him on the bench, and either start Carber if he's fit, or Blendell, or Ian Keatley, and just put them out there in that test, knowing full well what we know Sexton is capable of. Absolutely, and that, I mean that's what, what that's what I'd be doing. You know, is looking at right, giving one of these lads, um, whoever is your front runner for your number two um, out half, and let them let them run the show because that's where you get to know about people. You know, you don't want to wait till 2019, and you know, presumably it'll be a resurgence South Africa. Um, at that stage, and you know who are you going to send out to, you know, to win that game if it, if it if it is them that you know we end up being you know playing. Um, so yeah, I do, and I think you need to do it not just at ten. Like Conor Murray, I'd say best player in the world, possibly. My Munster bias hat is on now, but certainly, oh, obviously, he didn't win it at the weekend or yesterday, but you know, absolute best from half anyway. You know, Kieran Marmion has got a little bit more game time than what um, you know what maybe the the backup tens have. But also in, in the second row, if something happened to, to Dev, you know, Toner, who would lead that line out and who would sort of bring it? So would he be looking at Henderson or James Ryan and stuff like that? So I wouldn't be making all those changes all at one go. But I think you need to look at, 
you know, slightly different combinations um, during this Six Nations, bearing in mind that you still have another Six Nations, but it's the growth. But, you know, I'm sure he has um, certain plans. But if you went and said to Johnny Sexton that we're going to arrest you now just because, you know, he'd be raging as well, as everybody would when but you're the... the point, though, is it really? I mean, no. it's, it's not down to Johnny Sexton. Johnny Sexton wasn't there when we had yep. to play a World Cup quarter-final. And Ian Madigan, albeit, he didn't have that bad a game and obviously did brilliantly against France after Sexton was forced off. We don't want to be in a situation in Japan where Joey Carberry is starting a test for the first time outside, say, a meaningless trip to Canada or the United States on a summer tour that Sexton is not on. And this is the first time he's starting in two and a half years at 10 for Ireland, the biggest game of his life. That's it. I, I totally agree with you. Yeah, I totally agree that that's what we should be doing is, is starting him or Dell or whoever in the Six Nations. You know, God, you nearly start, give them one each, you know, with Sexton on the bench, wouldn't you just do it? No, I think so, because it was, I think, Joe's point after when we went out to Argentina in the last World Cup was that, you know, Mads hadn't enough game time, but like, you know, he sort of needs to rectify that this time going forward. I think the benefit is Blandau will be first choice number 10, you hope, for Munster by the time the World Cup rolls around. So at least he will be somebody who's playing week in, week out. At that point, Madigan just wasn't getting the game time, even at club level. So it was very difficult for him to step up. I think, yeah. I think clearly Schmidt has learned from that World Cup in that he has been absolutely ruthless in giving game time to players. Even when you think back to the team that he selected for the trip to Chicago against the All Blacks, there were a lot of kind of people going, oh, maybe he's not picking his strongest team really for this game and he's kind of targeting the home game. Obviously, he wasn't at all. It turned out he thought that they had the, the right game plan and we just, he was throwing players in. And that November, I think it was, everybody was giving out about him not putting ring rows on the team, but he was just given Ringrose that extra couple of months and then put him straight in the team for the Six Nations. So he has made those changes. He has given game time to players who are very young compared to what I would have said his modus operandi was for the first 18 months of his, t of his tenure. Yeah, there seems to be, doesn't there, like a, a bit of a change. And um, uh, God, he's such a good coach and everybody speaks so highly of him, you know, in terms of his attention to detail and stuff. So, you know, he has the full four-year cycle this time um, to put his plan and his... Um, his slant on it so yeah hopefully that all those um you know all those eventualities will be covered um this time around all right fiona great stuff thanks very much for joining us yeah great guys have a good day bye fiona steed there giving us her thoughts on the uh, november internationals atmosphere wasn't great i was saying this a little bit earlier that um Ireland were 20 nil up uh, just after half time and the crowd were kind of like going for drinks and getting up and not singing and not getting into it because there was no tension and then Argentina came back a little bit but you kind of always knew that Ireland just could go through the gears because it wasn't a really good Argentina team. Yeah, I mean, it's an Argentina team that we're missing a couple of its key men, a couple of its key playmakers, uh, Juan Martin Hernandez being chief amongst them. And it's very difficult on a cold November evening for the fans to stay with it when they pretty much know the game is done. And I've probably no doubt that human instinct in, on some level kicked in with the players and it seeps into them as well. Now, Joe Schmidt, I would imagine, is quietly pleased that the game ended the way it did because... The last memory that they have in Irish camp is of a couple of late tries leaked, uh, a scoreboard that very much favours you, not quite looking as good at the end of it. Yeah. And so that can be one of the things when they do meet, I think that there'll be a day, a couple of days where they meet in December, then obviously there'll be a couple of days in January before the Champions Cup fixtures return. It's a little bit of a rod for him to beat them with heading into the Six Nations camp. If you put 50 past Fiji, learn nothing. If you put 40 or 50 past an Argentinian team that are absolutely knackered, well, maybe you learn absolutely nothing from it. Do you kick the last penalty if like, that's the way life works? Is like you're supposed to treat this game on its merits like it was a World Cup pool game? You kick that penalty at the end instead of going for the corner or just go for the corner? I think you need to have trust in the guy who's got the ball in his hand to make that decision because that kind of a call is not coming in from the sideline. I think the right call was, was made in the end, but at the same just time... Just a bad line out. It, yeah, like we've we've put ourselves. I, I was at Cardiff last summer or last season, Six Nations for that game where we seemed to pound on the Welsh line all night and got absolutely nowhere. Where we went for the corner a couple of times from very kickable situations and we coughed up the line out. There's nothing more annoying for the players as well as the coach. Yeah. But I don't think you can blame a team for going for the corner and trying to leave with seven as opposed to three, particularly if you're up against a team that you know is going to score at the other end. It wasn't the case on Saturday in terms of the Argentinians, but if it's the All Blacks or England, for oh, example, totally, yeah. you mightn't get too many opportunities. I wonder if um, part of their decision making of the players and the pitch is like, actually, we don't have a video review for another couple of months after <laughs> this one. We can all go and have a good night tonight and not worry about what happens. 
Well, maybe you're looking for the reward as well. It is risk reward. And ah, totally. It would have been an amazing finish. They would have <coughs> they would have blown up the spread. I think if they scored that. But as it was, um, and the reward's not just in the scoreboard. You might be getting a pat on the back from Joe Schmidt as well for having the courage, your convictions, and going after it. I like. We didn't learn really an awful lot from the November internationals, bar seeing some of these guys wear a green shirt and, it, and it's great to see that. We've got serious competition if we're a little bit fortunate with injuries on the provincial scene over the next two months. We've loads of um, GA and football to come. One final video from the Aviva Fan Studio on Saturday. Uh, Mike McCarthy, Neve Briggs and Andrew Trimble were along and uh, here we're going to talk about the Ireland form heading into the 2018 Six Nations. One interesting point on the back of this, which we haven't mentioned just yet, was the fact that Scotland were absolutely awesome against Australia at the weekend. England obviously uh, a brilliant team at the moment and have their own selection headaches because of the quality of their strength and depth. So we'll talk a bit about that on the backside and also run you through a really uh, tumultuous weekend in GAA some of the smaller club teams around the country are doing really great stuff and then um, a superpower has re-emerged from uh, Cork and Nemo we'll talk about all of that after we get the thoughts here of Neil Briggs it's obviously been a very successful series from an Irish point of view yeah absolutely you know we've touched on it a bit um, any other coach would be over the moon Joe will be thinking right how do we get better straight away so that's the reason why we're so good, because he keeps driving standards. But you know, a lot of new guys brought into the the setup and three wins. So I think you know you'd, you'd do well to find something to be disappointed about. Again, just before we get into the meat of this game, on that point about like trying to find something that they can, because I, I mean, I'm assuming that even from the Fiji game, that would have been quite in a quiet moment. Josh Mitt would have been thinking, actually, that's not the worst thing that could happen here. So just in terms of that idea of going forward into the Six Nations, what would be one thing that each of you might identify as being a work on or an area to improve from an Irish point of view? I think it's very tough. I think we're nitpicking at this stage. I think I think we've been very, very good uh, for all three games. You know, uh, parts of Fiji. You know, you can tell there's a few new guys in there, a little bit of inexperience, and the game got a bit loose at times. But today we got our standards up again where they were, not quite to where they were for South Africa. It got a little bit loose at times, but um, defensively we were unbelievably solid in South Africa. We were solid for long periods today, and then the, the three tries they scored were all a little bit soft, mm -hmm. but. Shouldn't take away from how good our defence was for long periods, but just one or two moments uh, where we switched off. But we're really nitpicking at this stage, yeah. you know. One work on. Like Trimby said, I think if we're nitpicking, maybe a couple of times Argentina got out, outside us in the wide channel. So maybe a bit of that, you know, width, width in defence, which, uh, as again, I said, the 2015 game when Argentina, we were too narrow and they kept getting on the outside of us. So maybe a couple of times they did there. South Africa got on the outside of us a couple of times as, as well. So maybe that's an area. And then the other, the other area which um, Joe won't be happy about, and, you know, I've seen it myself and being in camp is, you know, that mental switch off after half time, letting Argentina, you know, the game was won, letting them back into the game. That's, that's a huge area which, uh, you know, Joe will be talking to the lads about uh, in the review. Yeah, similar. I think the huge mental switch off afterwards will, will be hard for Joe to take, I think, mm. because he doesn't ever switch off mentally. Um, and also, we, we were in the scoring zone a lot over these three games and weren't probably as clinical as we wanted to be. Um, and I think that'll definitely be an area that he'll want to work on. I think we had a huge amount of possession today again and didn't have a whole lot of points on the board for it. Mm. And I think that's a little bit of a worry. Is that a system thing or is that just an individual error thing that a lot of these players are getting used to this level? Uh, it could be, it could be a bit of both. I think, I think it was just, you know, maybe been not been patient enough at times. Um, I think, you know, we saw a couple of times there, Connor and Johnny tried cross the kicks that didn't work off, didn't come off. And but if they did come off, we'd be all singing their praises. So it's kind of that that fine balance of it. But um, yeah, it, but it's nitpicking, uh, yeah. as as Andrew said. I think definitely, um, if we had the ball for you know that amount of time, New Zealand or these big brilliant teams. They, they punish you for it, and that's where we have to strive for it, to be that rootless. Yeah, good stuff there from the uh, Viva Fan Studio on Saturday. One final that's point, Scotland. Obviously, crazy. Australia had a man sent off just before half-time, and that changes the texture of the game. But the ruthlessness on display, the creativity, and um, Stuart Hogg went off in the warm-up. Mm -hmm. So um, was it Maitland went to fullback, and they brought in uh, a Namibian-born South African project <laughs> player who, who scored at least two tries and potentially even a third. Um, so Scotland have a brilliant coach, strength and depth, a defined style of play, and a clear connection between what's going on in the provinces and their international team, and they are dangerous. They really are the dangerous team in the upcoming Six Nations. A lot of us in the years where we're in Twickenham and 
the Stade de France, we just assume that come that final game, if it's at, in London, it's going to be a Grand Slam decider. Yeah. Now, that's, we've come a cropper with the Scots in Croke Park. We come a cropper at the Viva Stadium. They can beat us when they're not at their best. Last but, year. Yeah, last, this is the best Scotland team probably since they won the, the Grand Slam back in 1990, I would say. Um, they should have been in a World Cup semi-final in 2015, and that's before Vern Cotter left. And you can see from the way they put 50 points in Australia, yes, as you say, down to 14 men, ridiculous elbow just before half-time that had us at probably an already very tired Australia in a bad way. But at the same time, you still have to create the opportunities. Yeah. You have to take all of them to get past the 50-point barrier without their best player, as you say, lo- losing their fullback in the warm-up. And whatever about what happens in the Aviva Stadium, that home game in the Six Nations they're in our pool in the World Cup which is another 18 months away or two years away rather for Gregor Townsend to get his clutches into them I think they're just going to get better yeah uh, really like really good chance they actually beat us in the World Cup not because we choke or anything but just because they're going to be just as good as us yeah uh, right let's move on to GAA big big weekend in the uh, AIB club championship um, we're going to start with Leinster Big win for Moorfield against uh, Rath New, 2.13 to 2.7. Afterwards, Daryl Flynn caught up with Oshin Langan. Close, are you? <laughs> <laughs> you're me. I am, yeah. Here with Daryl Flynn of uh, Moorfield, and as you've heard from Daryl there, we're pretty close. We've had to come inside into the dressing rooms in Auckland because the weather outside is so miserable. But Moorfield, you don't care about the weather right now. You're into a Leinster final, having beaten Rathnew 2.13 to 2.7. Daryl, talk to me about how tough that was. Um, look, it was uh, very tough. And you can see as the conditions outside, you know, probably didn't help. But it was a scrappy enough game. But you know, it was a good score, 2.13 to 2.7. So plenty of excitement there for the fans as well, for both sides and all. But thankfully, our fans are happier coming out. What was the talk in your dressing room at half five, because, or at half time? Because it was level at that stage, 1-5 apiece. And they had kind of stayed in it despite the fact that you played most of the football yeah we played most football but it was probably a wrong time to concede the goal you know, just a half time you know so all the momentum to them but look we just had to regroup get over it was no G as well so but no thankfully we came out in the second half we got a few points ahead again and then conceded again so look that's something we need to work on as well and train over the next two weeks and whatever and you decided to be the aggressors in Wicklow which is a brave step now when I say the word aggressor I mean you pushed up on the kickouts you really went for it and it paid off yeah, look, I did. You know, look, them conditions there was never going to be much marks or a clean ball wouldn't there in the middle. So it was all about the, the breaks and that. You know, so we had to we worked hard to get in for them. And look, thankfully we won fucking the majority of them. So look, it worked out well for us. And what does it mean to you to be- get back to a Leinster final? Probably your first one actually, because you were probably a bit young to have played last time. No, I was playing last. Were you? Myself and Ross were midfield the last. Oh, time, were you so. twelve? <laughs> no, no. I won't say what age, because then you'll know. You're eleven years, so you know. So. No, look, that was phenomenal. I remember actually that day, it was probably like there in Port Leash against Road. It was a very dirty day, but look, this is a totally new team. As I said, there was a few of us still hanging themselves. Rowley, Dave White came on that day, scored a wonderful goal, so, and Cali. So look, we're back, you know, it's a different different setup, different teams, great young lads there as well, and they'll enjoy it, but uh, we look forward to it. Is there a feeling of relief as well as joy? Because I suppose your suspension has been well talked about, so to actually yeah. get there having gone through that kind of silliness, is there a feeling of, who? thank God, yeah, well, look, obviously, you know, it's probably not nice to be suspended, missing games, but look, thankfully, got back in and worked my way back into the team, and um, look, it all worked out well at the end of the day, but two weeks now to, to get ready for a big one. Daryl, well done, and uh, best of luck in the Leicester final. Cheers, thanks, man. Yeah, there's something old school about seeing the inside of the dressing room, harking back to those happy days when the media could just walk in, and ask questions Wonder wherever in. they wanted all to. All-Ireland final day. No big deal. The 07 All Ireland hurling final. I'm standing there with Henry Shefflin, who's just torn his cruciate, with Lee McCarthy on the bench beside him in the Kilkenny change room. Only 10 years ago, Jer. Yeah. You'd have to get through an awful lot of security to get near there now. Yeah, and the world fell like in on itself in a black hole of like crap because you got access to the dressing room, obviously. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Well, everything just fell apart. Right. Despite winning by um, seven points, Moorfield were reduced to 14 men during the game. Keen O'Connor shown a straight red in the second half. There's the red card there. Luckily for him, his brother Aina was the star of the show, kicking eight points for Moorfield. And uh, you might recognise the name, because there's their da. Here's the two lads with their da, Jack. They're both teachers, I think, um, transferred a couple of years back. There was some talk around that point of maybe Jack getting the move to Kildare, and then he got the uh, minor gig and the under-21 gig, as it was. And uh, obviously that's not going to happen now. Um, Oshin did also catch up with the Evergreen Leighton Glynn afterwards as well. The Jewel Star still has a Leinster Intermediate hurling final against the infamous Bally Raggett to look forward to with Clint Ely. Hard luck today, beaten by Moorfield 2-13 to 2-7 
in the Leinster Club semi-final. I imagine having beaten club royalty in the shape of St Vincent's, you're disappointed not to have got to the final, not to have won in what is essentially a home patch in Ockram. Yeah, we're devastated. Um, look, we probably came up short. Moorfield were the better team, I think, on the day. But um doesn't really soften the blow. We thought we were getting to a Leinster final. We tried our hardest, tried our damnedest, but a um, few costly errors there where we were chasing the game and Moorfield punished us. But they're, they're good, good value for the win, Moorfield. In the second half, they simply found scores easier to come by. Yeah, definitely. Um, they moved the ball pretty well into their full forward line and a couple of sharpshooters in there. We probably didn't give our defence enough of a kind of, of a dig out. We were, we were pushing on. We were always trying to cat, play and catch up and that can be difficult at times but um, when the scores pre- presented themselves they, they took them so fair play to them. And for much of this team you kind of can't lay it down and lick your wounds can you? You're involved in the Leinster Intermediate Club hurling final next week against Ballyragget. I imagine that's a really great thing that's a, that's a blessing to have something yeah. to look, up, look forward to straight away well that's just five of us involved now with Glenelly next week playing Bally Ragged we're going down there um, for a Leinster final um, so we have to pick ourselves up the rest of the lads will be down but um, there's no we can't be licking our wounds we have to just get back on the horses to say and try to give that a rattle next week and a lot of people that are here today supporting the football will be in Kilkenny next week um, so look it's fantastic to be playing football this time of the year and hurling for um in the, clu- in the club scene and um, look keeps people happy and gets people out of the house on winter days and look even though we were beaten today we had a fantastic year with a great win against Vincent's um, a good one against Newtown Blues we won a championship so like happy days okay we're not in the Leinster final but pick yourself up dust yourself off and go again I imagine Andy Club will take a county title if offered at the start of the year uh, just before I let you go playing in Nolan Park against Ballyragget next week. I mean, it's away from home, but it's, it's kind of a good thing in a way because that's a hurling amphitheatre. And for clubs like Glen Ely and players in Wicklow, they love when they get to play in these kind of stages because it's not something they often get to do. Yeah, 100%. And look, ask any player, when you get to that level or you're playing in an arena, like, or if you get to an Nolan Park or a Crow Park, like an extra 10 or 15% comes across you as a player. Like it comes out of you, um, especially if you're from a so-called week or county or, or club um, like you rise to it and any player worth his fucking his salt will, um, will rise to that you know yeah. make with that <laughs> <laughs> it's the internet so we can play whatever we want Leighton best of luck next week hard luck today yeah, and uh, best of luck as I say next weekend cheers lad thanks <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't bother Leighton. Sorry about that. Yeah, I know. Fair play. <laughs> right, Moorfield are going to face uh, St. Lomans in the <coughs> Leinster final. Uh, that's St. Lomans of Westmead. They recovered from an early seven point deficit to beat the Mead champions, Simonstown. Simonstown? Simonstown. 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 Yeah. The town belongs to Simon. That is uh, Colm O'Rourke, Simonstown. Um, no fear of a jersey clash there. Look, is that blue on blue? Not really. Ah, come on. It's, it's not blue quite on blue. Ireland, South Africa. It's, uh, that's Shane O'Rourke of Simonstown, the Mead goalkeeper. And, no? No, the, sh- the Mead. Call him son Shane. Oh yeah, sorry, it's his nephew. Centre forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fair play. And Paul Sherry. I'm getting absolutely balled out of it here by my uh, Mead producer for <laughs> mixing up the O'Rourke's. Apologies to uh, all of the O'Rourke's and to all our Mead viewers. And uh, Anyway, yeah. Uh, for the second year in a row though, Schlott and Neil have won a treble of Ulster hurling, camogie and football titles. This tweet from Christy McCaig. In 2016-2017, our club hurlers and footballers have played a total of 27 championship matches. We've won 25 of them. We look forward collectively to the next set of challenges after Christmas. Time for a few days off. Aaron Kernan tweeted back going, that's more championship games in one year than most people get in a lifetime. (laughs) It's incredible. What a journey they're on. Um, It's the double treble they're referring to, the camogie, the hurling and the football provincial championships won in back-to-back years. Still, the wait goes on for Cavan football, though, Jerry. That's that's what I took from the weekend. Well, at least they got to a final. That was their first final in three decades. Yeah, since '95 when Bellyborough reached the final. But they are just one of two counties. We always hear that pop quiz question or table quiz question. Only Ulster County never to have won an Ulster Championship, which is Fermanagh. Well, the only two counties never to have won an Ulster Club Championship are Fermanagh and Cavan. And um, it does look like Cavan Gales, who are very much the kingpin to Cavan, they're still a long way off the likes of Stock Neil because they were never really in it. I think Stock Neil were leading by double digits with 25 minutes left in that second half yesterday. It was never really a contest. The other thing is, everybody said that what happened to Slot Neil last year would be a once in a lifetime achievement, but just have a look at this and uh, check out the age profile. It's a pretty young team. They could be here for a while yet. Yeah, like a lot of f- fresh faces around there, and um, I think Chris McKay's only 28 as well, so he's definitely going to keep going, I'd say, until he's about 44. 
as part of that setup. He's getting a new lease of life these, these young guys. Their economy yesterday it was incredible. 25 shots on the goal, they scored from 16 of them. I mean, if you're coming up with that kind of efficiency, even if, if you're up against a really good team that are going to restrict your chances, you're always going to have a chance. Yeah, so... Um, there's a, we we talk about Nemo a little bit later on as well because uh, you know at this point Slot Neil have been installed as favourites for the championship. But let's keep going because we've got a fairly tasty intermediate All Ireland semi final to look forward to in the new year. Sean Cavanagh's Moy were big winners yesterday, but also on Gwail Talks, which means that we're going to see potentially Mark O'Shea up against uh, Sean Cavanagh. Um, a throwback to uh, when the two lads were very young and the uh, shirts were very big on them. <laughs> tighter, they wear much tighter shirts these days, right? For all sorts of reasons. Yeah. So Nemo beat Croaks, and again, this was relatively one-sided considering um, the pre-match suggestion was that this was going to be nip and tuck the whole way through, but ultimately it wasn't. Nemo dealt with Croaks relatively straightforward. There is Paul Carrigan in full flight yesterday. Unfortunately, he went off with what looked like a serious enough injury towards the end of the game, and he'd be a massive loss because he's one of those players who, at this level, really stands out and has that skill set to win the game on his own, but also has the nous to make sure that everybody around him is going well. Yeah, if they that, now he, I saw him celebrating afterwards. Like he, he seemed to be very much part of it as well. So you would hope the injury isn't something that's going to be a hangover into the new year and potentially rule him out of an All Ireland semi final. But like Derek Connolly for Vincent, for example, in that club scene, he just is clearly the standout player on that team. He's that to Nemo, and when Paul Kerrigan's at full flow, it's very hard to stop him. Wins an awful lot of frees as well. And you'd have to feel sorry for Croaks because they've worn the crown of All Ireland champions incredibly well. It's just they came up against a really strong team. Yeah, yeah I think when you're the defending All Ireland champions, if you get to this stage of the season. And fair play. Yeah, like you didn't go completely defense. crazy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So wonder now if um, this might be the end for Colin Gooch Cooper. Um I mean, certainly not in terms of what he can bring to the club scene. I was down for the Kerry Championship semi finals, still running the show. Yeah. Why would he stop? Well, if he's enjoying it, and he clearly has spoken this year of how much he's enjoying giving it back to the club, having yeah. spent so much time away from them. I don't see any reason for him to stop playing because it's not like his game is built on raw pace like it might have been very early in his career. He's just the guy pulling the strings now, creating the opportunities. He can go his true forward passes for are just ridiculous. Yeah, so he can just do that for five years, can't he? Get his hands on the ball five or six times, you almost contribute enough for them to win pretty much most Kerry Championship matches. Whatever about provincial level, clearly they came up against a better team yesterday. And build a team, build the forwards around it, look for some athletic guys in the half-forward line, look for some cute corner forwards who can get on the end of those and happy days, you know? Might be one or two of them knocking around Kerry, all right. Yeah. So, Corfin of Galway uh, retained their Connacht title after an extra time win against Castlebar Mitchells of Mayo. This is um, Corfin players were allowed to walk through a gate there. <laughs> this is Gate Gate. Have we had a Gate Gate before? But Castlebar has had to hop the fence. Not entirely convinced uh, we've got to the bottom of why that happened. Perhaps they chose to do it in some kind of show of machismo. But that's <laughs> unlikely, right? Well, Normally, there is footage knocking around of it where there, there's two stewards standing behind the gate as the um, Mitchells, one of the Mitchells officials, is questioning why they're not gaining access. Yeah. I don't know, was it the key was lost? Was somebody... I hope it was. ...maybe doing a little bit of a job's worth on it and deciding this was his moment to shine? <laughs> <laughs> Which hope wouldn't wouldn't be unheard of across various <laughs> grounds across the country, Jerry. I hope it's a lost key. <laughs> How much of an impact did it have in the game? I'm not sure. The dog swallowed the key. A shout out to Michal Lundy. That was appendix for removed ten days ago, and he played a massive part in that win for Currafin yesterday. That's hardcore. That is tough. Yeah, these are the celebrations here. Um, I, like, I'd say Currafin are liking the fact that Neil are uh, Bucky's favourites. Everybody wrote us off. I mean, they're a pretty good team, right? Well, as soon as Vincent's got knocked out of the Leinster Championship, those big four, if you want to include Nemo and Croaks, along with Curry finish Loch Neil, in their own minds, they probably consider themselves All-Ireland favourites. The TG Carr Ladies All-Star Awards were Saturday night, uh, unsurprisingly dominated by the uh, dubs. That's uh, pretty hard for you to read there, but Cor Staunton did make the cut at um, full forward. Six dubs in the team. Uh, Kira Trant in goals and uh, a couple of other ones there of particular interest. I think um, uh, ultimately Noelle Healy was always going to be a shoe in for her All Star because she ended up being Footballer of the Year as well. Um, documentary on tonight about the Dublin footballers, um, the Dublin women's football team. I think we should start the campaign to stop calling them ladies because they're women. It's a women's football team and uh, they allowed the cameras be in with them <coughs> the whole year through and they won the All-Ireland. I mean, maybe, you know, not being closed off to the media is the way to go. <laughs> 
you're going to keep banging that drum, aren't you? That's, yeah, it you know, doesn't make any sense. Me, the media access does uh, not in any way hamper it, your chances of winning a championship. But it also enhances the careers of the individuals involved. Like, Sean Kavanagh spoke to the media throughout his career, and now he's going to end up as one of our best pundits. Like, that's because he feels confident and comfortable enough in his own skin. But if you're constantly told you can't speak to the media and you're undercut every time you do, then how does that help you develop as a person? How does it develop as a thinker? Like, the GAA media are very gentle with the people that they're interviewing because ultimately, ultimately, perhaps everybody's in this together. Yeah, I agree, but I do think it's maybe a little bit easier, but also very much more important in the women's game to have this kind of access because, you know, no matter what happens in All-Ireland Football Final, the men's final is going to have a sellout. There's, you could probably sell it twice over no matter who's involved. They're trying to r replicate the crowds they got in this year's championship from the women's point of view and gain that kind of access, that kind of an insight into w the way they prepare themselves. It's probably a bit more important. I think it was a brilliant idea. That's not to say that the men's, couldn't, men's game couldn't take something from it, but it's, it's more important in terms of the, the gap that has to be made up in promoting and marketing the women's game. Yeah, um, and maybe they can just do it better as well, not just copy what has happened in the men's game. Shout That's out to Matty Ford before we leave the GAA yeah. chat. 38 years old, helping kill an Aaron to the Leinster inter Intermediate title over the weekend, still kicking scores. Oh, nice what one. What a hero. They're up against who? Ford, Cavan and O'Shea are all in the semi-finals of that Intermediate Championship. The Intermediate Championship was absolutely brilliant. There's amazing yeah. stories in it. Well, there's, look, there's inter-county players all over the Intermediate and Junior Championships. That's just the way things are. And every inter-county manager is trolling the county. It, it, you don't have to be a senior player to be getting into a senior inter-county team nowadays. There's a good chance these games might be played in October next year when the weather's a little bit better than they are because it was an absolutely freezing weekend and that maybe the quality of the pitches will be that little bit better and the games will get better and there'll be more attention on them because the inter-county season is actually two months over by that point. Yeah, and um, well that's the whole idea, isn't it, of bringing this all into the, the one calendar year and the hope that at some stage we will not have to see the best players in the country or some of the best players in the country absolutely freezing and low scoring games that do not reflect the quality of the players on show. Shane Stapleton and Joseph Connery doing great work for us here on Off The Ball over the last uh, couple of months. They've brought you some brilliant um, video highlights and the latest one that we have knocking about is a feature on David Goff. If you haven't seen any of this yet, then check it out, youtube.com forward slash Off The Ball for the whole interview. But here he is specifically talking about why referees need to demand respect. Are there problems in terms of respect that referees are getting? Yes, but I think on and off the field. Then. On and off the field, both. Um, I, I think there's there's sometimes a lack of respect from the media, um, uh, partially because of of an ignorance of, and I mean ignorance by, insofar as a lack of knowledge, in 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 what we're trying to do and and the rules we're trying to implement. Um, there's certainly a lack of respect sometimes among the managers and players, but that is resultant in us allowing for that respect or lack of respect to, to manifest itself. So if we if we cut it out straight away and um, insist on a certain level of respect, then that respect flows and it becomes natural and it becomes mutual between the players and the and the referee. So sometimes you know you would have been the focus of of the media, for example, you, you came out and explained your decision after the Dublin Kerry All-Ireland semi-final in 2016 when Peter Crowley was barged into by Kevin McManaman mm -hmm. and you explained on the radio later on that Michael Fitzsimons had blocked her line of sight so you couldn't see it. But you got a, there was a huge fallout from that. Can you explain what that was like and even after you, you clarified the issue, what was that like for you? Um, it was difficult because I went into LMFM that, that Saturday afternoon to do, to do the interview and it wasn't based around the, the Peter Crowley incident. It was just a general chat about refereeing and, and, and lifestyle. And the question was asked, and I answered it honestly, but I didn't think the media would have picked up on, on the answer. It was almost six months after, after the incident happened, and it certainly wasn't my focus for that interview to go in and, and deal with that incident. Um, it was just a very honest account of what happened. Um, and there was huge fallout from it. And I still don't understand why when I just answered an, a, a question honestly and, and the video analysis will back up exactly what I said. And, and it's unfortunate that it, it caused such media attention. I mean, that could have been clarified immediately after the game had someone asked what, what, what was the issue. Um, it was just very simple. If you don't see it, you can't call it. Were you ever tempted to just tweet out after the game, I didn't see it? 
No, I wouldn't say I was tempted um, or well... You want to, presumably, because you uh, want to clarify the situation. Yeah, you'd like to clarify the situation, but we're well versed in, in, in the dangers of social media um, through our uh, education programmes with, with the referees in Croke Park, and it's just a no-go area for us. I don't tweet about about matches or matches I've refereed or, or incidents in matches. It's just not the professional thing to do. Um, decisions are made. They're made a, a split second um, in the height of a, a very challenging environment to, to, to referee and control 30 players. And uh, you make them with the, the best will and, and good intentions in the world that you're, that you're making the right decisions. And I would very rarely question any of the decisions I have made. It's the ones that I don't make are the ones that I, I, I usually find fault with. Yeah, really interesting stuff from David Goff going in depth there with Shane Stapleton. You can get the full interview on youtube.com forward slash off the ball. And you should subscribe to our videos there to get notifications whenever we're updating stuff because we'll be updating stuff a good bit during the day, every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. <laughs> Loads of good stuff coming your way. Let's uh, bring you through the UK newspaper headlines. We're going to start with The Guardian this morning. This is an interesting story here. Uh, Bearstow headbutt claim adds to Ashes misery for England. The English wicketkeeper is alleged on a night out to have bumped into uh, one of his Australian counterparts. The um, security were all there and uh, everybody kept drinking all night together. But in the middle of it, it's alleged that um, the England wicketkeeper headbutted one of the, uh, I can't remember the name of the Aussie, but um, there was a coming together of heads anyway. Yeah, there the was, Guardian um, seems to be suggesting that the English players were like, no, this didn't happen. But the Aussies apparently were bringing it up in the middle of the trouncing that they were handing out to the English cricket team. Yeah, Cameron Bancroft was the Aussie cricketer that was supposedly the subject of the headbutt. And then when Bairstow went out to bat in the second innings, the one of the Australian fielders hurled a volley of abuse at him, sledging, I think they call it down there, and it was thought to be very much linked to the so-called headbutt. Like, uh, you know, what do you do? What's the, oh, I can't believe you were so pissed you headbutted one of my teammates? What's, how do you, I mean, I'm obviously not that good at sledging that I can come up with a good thing to sledge about. I don't know, you clearly were unable to keep your cool in that bar the other night. Once we get under your skin now, watch, you're going to implode. Look at all these people who are watching. Okay, okay. You've absolutely no mental you're better than I am. capacity to, yeah. to stick it to us. Yeah, four weeks. They it, didn't. Was, it was four weeks ago and nothing came out in the meantime. So Look, talk of a headbutt as well. I mean, you hear about headbutts in football, which is often like. a case of somebody nudging their head into the forehead of the other guy, yeah. both ultimately probably hitting the ground, but no real contact. Yeah, so the Telegraph next? Yeah, well, they do lead with that as well. It's, um, it's an interesting one because Bairstow in headbutt row, the ECB are investigating the wicketkeeper's late night bar fracas with Australian rival. Now, ultimately, there will be some kind of something coming out of this, but I don't think it's going to have any influence on the rest of the series, which England are trailing in. But there's a very good story in the back. Club icon to could not cut it in national colours. I don't. No, did you see those that ten minutes between Jared Lampard and Ferdinand on BT Sport of the no, weekend? No, it's good. Brilliant viewing if you can get get your hands on it. It's everywhere at the moment. Basically, they're just talking about their time as England teammates. Why the so-called golden generation were unable to win anything or at least get to a major tournament semi-final? Real honesty from the three of them. They gave a number of reasons to why England. They were winning Champions players. Leagues. Winning Champions Leagues, winning Premier Leagues. On paper, as uh, Ferdinand put it, we the best midfield in the world. You pick any four from Gerrard, Lampard, Beckham, um, Carrick, Scholes. I mean, world class footballers, and they couldn't get, a, get it done when beyond the quarter Did you just slip Michael day. Carrick into that? <clears throat> well, Gerrard. Sir Tisley slipping Michael Carrick into the middle of that list. Ferdinand slipped Michael Carrick in, but there he was, a Manchester United teammate of his. Gerrard said, That's and they all said the there was no bond between them. They, would ne they used to sit at different tables. Ferdinand didn't really want to say anything in front of Lampard or Gerrard in case they could use it against him yeah. in later games involving Liverpool, Chelsea, and Manu. There's a good chapter in Ferdinand's book about Fall Night with uh, Lampard. They, they would travel together, they came up together, they were best mates, and then. At just West over Ham, a period yeah. of time it was like oh how are you how are you and then they wouldn't talk to each other anymore and then Jared at the end decided to throw Sven Joran Eriksson and Fabio Capello under the bus fair enough <laughs> I mean, that been... said, if we'd had a manager that had a tactical setup and had a real philosophical obvious way of playing we might have had a better chance of getting to a semi-final that would have been my starting point throw those two under the bus and then yeah. well, I mean maybe we share some of the blame right I mean Rio you definitely do uh, Jared should have been the honest broker and all that given how crap they were in the league for most of that period of time anyway before we uh, irate, make the Liverpool fans any too much more <laughs> irate let's have a look at the London Independent headlines uh, again the uh, ECB Pro Bairstow headbutt on Bancroft 
Pep and Sterling. And then Wenger defends Ramsey. Uh, Ramsey accused of diving, so, I mean, maybe he did. We'll find out, um, because obviously they can retrospectively um, ban him for simulation. Yeah, I wouldn't imagine Ramsey's going to have a case to answer. The Sun in the UK, it's um, basically focusing on Pep Guardiola and uh, Romelu Lukaku as well. More Johnny Bairstow with a sore head. Again, those claims are going to be investigated. Pep's happy to suffer. We've already referenced the fact that he was delighted with the manner in which they were forced to eke out that win over Huddersfield Town yesterday. And then the match reports from Southampton's hammering of Everton and that late smashing grab from Arsenal at Turf Moor. And the rag that is the Daily Express, uh, Unsworth Agony, Pardew in the bag, Alan Pardew set to be unveiled as West Brom's new manager in the next 48 hours. At least West Brom have had the dignity and grace to get this thing done relatively quickly. They've ended up with Alan Pardew, so, you know, how good that's going to be in the end. Let's wait and see. Uh, Sterling and Pep, Bairstow in butt row. <laughs> And uh, Hartley facing signing threat. Dylan Hartley, this is a headline from any time over the last 12 or 14 <laughs> years. Dylan Hartley is in danger of um, being cited for something or other, which obviously no one really cares about. Oh, yeah, okay, good man. Great little reference to The Last Boy Scout and Off the Ball this morning. What a film. Have you seen The Last Boy Scout? Damon Wyans and Bruce Willis? I haven't, only it's doing you a, a real service saying that it was a great little reference to the movie, given that you could, A, couldn't remember the name and mix it up in another one. Yeah, but I was right, and ultimately, <laughs> I got the plot of that one right, and uh, it was The Last Boy Scout. It would have been Blast Boy Scout as opposed to Blast Action Heroes if uh, you were right about The Last Can't Action Can't save Hero. it now. Um, we can have a quick look at the one of the main stories coming out of the UK papers this morning. This is um, the Frampton story, and actually this is uh, from the journal, it looks like. Uh, Carl Frampton will launch a countersuit following the news that Cyclone Promotions and uh, Blaine McGuigan have launched proceedings against their former client, the boxer's solicitor has confirmed. So this is a statement from John Finucane saying that Frampton is deeply disappointed that Cyclone Promotions have decided to initiate legal action against him and says he's going to defend the action rigorously. So it did look like things had gone pear-shaped between the um, two parties just over the last couple of months when you started to realise uh, the speed at which he was signing with MTK and ultimately when it comes to boxing these relationships so frequently break down. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that the fighter goes in and fights and puts his life on the line and it's hard for everybody who is around that to ever fully appreciate that and you would have thought and hoped that McGuigan would have um, been able to kind of have that empathy and that because of the, f the shared experiences that that was one of those relationships which wouldn't end up like this. Obviously we don't know the ins and outs of, of what happened on both sides but uh, it's a real pity that this does seem to happen with um, terrifying regularity in boxing. Yeah, it does happen an awful lot, the, and so I think it, it is to be expected. Some of the great trainer-fighter relationships over the years have ended in a way that you would hope they wouldn't, but at the same time, the sad part for me is that it's potentially going to end up in the courts. Now, you'll hope that they don't make it that far, that if it gets even to the steps of the courts, it does get d taken care of before they get into the meat and drink of it, but it's just, as you said, it echoes what happened in the 80s with Barney um, Eastwood and Brian McGuigan. You would hope that it just doesn't go that far, and it's, it's really sad because you would have found it very difficult to believe that in such a short space of time after winning the world title that the mcguigan Frampton relation would become this fractious. Yeah, totally. Let's take a look at the uh, Premier League results over the course of the weekend. Uh, we'll talk with Dave now <coughs> about that Huddersfield-Man City game. Uh, so West Ham and Leicester drew one all on Friday night. Palace beat Stoke. Roy Hudson, this is his level and he's actually doing quite well at the moment. Swansea and Bournemouth, the real classic, nil all. Liverpool and Chelsea, one all. Um, a late equaliser from Chelsea in that one. Arsenal scored very late on at Burnley to put themselves back in the top four and kind of maybe give the lie to the fact that the team had no resilience. Southampton absolutely mullered Everton in the second half yesterday. 4-1 win for them. Newcastle hammered at home by Watford. Spurs and West Brom. Again, that Wembley issue. Um, and maybe it's not Wembley, it's just this, uh, them, the squad is too small to be able to compete in the Champions League and do this properly. And uh, a fluky win for Manchester United against Brighton. Is that fair? Um, yes, sir. more fluky than, say, Manchester City's win over Huddersfield. Both eked out late on, both uh, desperately trying to break down the opposition, but cities came after creating chance after chance after chance. Manchester United weren't creating any chances, bar one good opportunity for Pogba in the first half. What has impressed you so much about... Um, OK, so obviously Man City are playing some of the best football that we've ever seen, but in particular at the game yesterday, a bit of resilience about them too. Yes, I don't even know if resilience is the right word, and I'm going to borrow a... a 
a phrase from the Dublin book, but it was just sticking to the process. They just kept playing the same way for the entire game. There was no long balls lumped forward. They resorted to a lot of diagonal balls, which I wouldn't necessarily consider as a long ball. I mean, a long ball can be a very good ball if it's thought through and it's accurate and precise, but the movement of the wingers is incredible. From Leo Rossani on the left-hand side and Raheem Sterling on the right-hand side, the amount of times that they shape to go outside waiting for the pass and then just jink in, jink inside and the fullback doesn't know where to go. Yeah. So the, the Stavit Silva and De Bruyne, they didn't have their best games yesterday. They're always trying to find that little angled pass between fullback and the right or left sided central defender. More often than not, it doesn't come off, but it only needs to come off once because then someone like Sané is in behind, up against the byline, and then you're hoping that our guy's getting into the edge of the penalty area to put it away, as nearly happened with Fernandinho on at least two occasions yesterday. When you're at the game, are, are De Bruyne and... Um, so the, are they in a line? Like, what, what's the alignment of that? Yeah, they're almost parallel to each other. Yeah. They're um, or level level with each other. But they're about maybe twenty meters in from the left on the right hand side, yeah. and the ball has constantly been fed into their feet by the central defenders and the two fullbacks. They had a problem in the first half in that Kyle Walker didn't overlap once, and Pat Nevin brought it up in commentary that Raheem Sterling and Cleo Rossani had clearly been told to stay as widen the pitch as much as possible to try and spread the Huddersfield back four and the two sitting midfielders, and it meant that Kyle Walker, if Raheem Sterling is there. He has nowhere to go. Yeah. So Sterling in the second half started coming inside 10, 15 metres, left acres of space for Walker to get down. And that's where the penalty came from. The equaliser just two minutes, I think, into the second half. In fact, it led to two penalty incidents within two minutes of each other. One not given, the second was given. And it was all down to Kyle Walker getting down on the outside. Uh, well, has Walker been a success so far? Absolutely. He's been. Uh, he's maybe an unsung hero in that the plaudits are usually going to the likes of Silva, Aguero, De Bruyne, Gabriel Jesus, Raheem Sterling, who's their top scorer. But Kyle Walker, particularly since Mendy has picked up that injury on the other side of the defence and they've kind of had to throw in a James Milner like left full back in Fabian Delft, Kyle Walker looks every inch of the £50 million pound full back that they paid for, paid for him. How's Delft getting on? He was really good yesterday. Yeah. Bar a couple of dodgy moments in the first half where Tom Ince got the better of him, close to the Brighton or the Huddersfield penalty area. He overcommitted himself one or twi- once or twice. Um, but again, that maybe is the kind of indecision or the wrong decision made by a player who's not used to playing in that position. But he'll get better, as Milner did all through last season and was arguably the best left fullback in the Premier League last season. Doesn't want to play there now, it would appear. But I think Delft could be that. Um, Danilo played during the week against Feyenoord. <coughs> Long term, maybe he is the option when they're waiting for many to come back from that cruciate. But um, I think they're fairly well stocked. They, I, I'm not sure if it's too early to talk about um, Arsenal in 2004, but at some stage we're going to have to have that discussion. You think they could be? I think it's very possible that yeah. they go through the season unbeaten. It's these games like this where it's after a European week where there have been a bit of injuries and somebody's playing at a position that they get caught, but actually they don't look like they're going to get caught. They don't look like they're going to concede two or three goals in a game at the moment. Now, company had one or two issues early in the game yesterday. Depot was the Huddersfield Town Centre forward and he had a brilliant game, pretty much up there on his own. They do miss John Stones. Pat Nevin said to me, who do you think in my opinion, is in Pat's opinion, is the most indispensable player in that City squad. I'm thinking, I had to think outside the box. I said uh, Ederson, who is arguably the best keeper in the Premier League at the moment, given the form that he's so composed with the ball at his feet, unlike Claudio Bravo. He said John Stones. He thinks that he makes that team tick. Uh, he's missing at the moment. He's going to be out for about six weeks. And they have Otamendi and company at the back, who I don't fully trust. But they've gone to Wembley or to Stamford Bridge and they've won. They've hammered... Arsenal, they've hammered Liverpool, uh, they've cruised through their Champions League group, and now they're digging out the results against the likes of Huddersfield Town. Yeah. 11 men behind the ball are going to make life really awkward for you. Look, it's a huge ask to go 38 games unbeaten, but they've won 17 in a row. Not technically, though. That run does include the penalty shootout League Cup win over Wolves, which in their UEFA record books does not constitute a win. OK, well, fair enough. Uh, uh, maybe they don't care too much about that and they can just concentrate <laughs> on the league. Uh, we were talking about Lampard and Gerrard earlier on. Jesus, it sounds like great crack to have played for England, says uh, Kevin Caban last night watching that thing. <clears throat> maybe that's part of the issue. Like, the toxicity from the press and the fans has to, at some point, feed into the players who are like constantly being told by the press, why are you so shit? Why, well, why have we been so shit for so long? Against Iceland in particular in the second, second, second half of that knockout game in the European Championships last season, they just were paralysed by fear. And Gerrard said yesterday, he recalls, you know, as the teams break up, the club teams break up for at the international window and everyone's gone their separate ways. Yeah. The Brazilian lads couldn't wait to get out of there. Couldn't wait to meet up with their teammates. Couldn't wait to share the stories because they're all coming from very different parts of the world. Yeah. Every other international team, bar England, their international players are spread out 
across now, a whole number of leagues. Doesn't happen with England. They're all up against each other, kicking lumps out of each other every week. Now maybe there's so few of the English players actually key players for the teams who are going to be winning and competing for the championship that uh, there's a potential for them to kind of see this I as an escape. Have, I think that's a good point, and it's one that they brought up yesterday as well. That Gareth Southgate is trying to bring about a real bond, more of a club feel to the yeah. place, and that will help. That they're not all in the Champions League teams. They're not all chasing the Premier League yeah. title and the, all these the limelight and all the scrutiny that goes with, with being an Arsenal or a Chelsea, Liverpool, Manchester United or Superstar, City. Superstar, yeah. I mean, if you're playing very well for West Brom, for example, you might be far more likely to get on with your England teammates. Yeah, uh, let's talk a bit about Dortmund. Um, Dave spent the whole of Saturday night watching uh, German football. <laughs> for it was a throwback to the old days, Jer. Yeah, so 4-0 down, 4-0 up, and then finished 4 all. What happened in this game? They were 4-0 up, and then it finished 4 all. They, <laughs> <laughs> they just imploded in the last half an hour. It was incredible to watch. I watched them on Tuesday night when they were beaten by Tottenham. Despite going in front, there is a growing level of trepidation as the game ticks on. So Dortmund are having a picture of their halftime cup of tea, and I can't see what they're drinking. Is it booze? Is there, are, Sch are the Schalke suggesting that they're boozing to celebrate a 4 all draw, or is it, um, is it like mulled wine? Well, it is a huge derby game. Hot so cider. if there's a little bit of alcohol in that drink that uh, Schalke are enjoying, well, fair play to them. It was incredible scenes at the end when they got the fourth goal with seven minutes of injury time. When the board went up, you knew Dortmund were screwed. Yeah. That the goal was going to come eventually. Missing their first choice goalkeeper, so Weidenfeller, who's now 35, I think. Although May did make a couple of really good saves, he was at fault for a couple of, go of the goals as well. And on a weekend where Bayern went down to Borussia and Munchen Gladbach, it was a great opportunity for Dortmund to go back into the title race because they w could have found themselves just six back. But it's still They're just eight. not good enough anymore, are they? No, well, look, they're being pulverised every transfer window. Whoever their best player is, is gone. Um, they lost Goethe to an injury at the weekend, although I'm not sure how much of a loss that is because he is a shadow of the player he once was yeah. in comparison to the guy that was no, he's lived a good life. by Bayern. He looks like a player who's lived a good life. He's, he's had a good life. He's going to be happy enough. He does not look like to me that he's a, pro a professional footballer. Uh, to La Liga and the situation with Barcelona, a one-all draw against Valencia at the weekend. A beautiful um, assist from Leo Messi, but it looks like they should really have had a goal as well. This is Lineker, now they don't have goal line technology in La Liga, I think they'll be re revisiting the debate after Messi's goal was ruled not to have crossed the line when it clearly did. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Isn't it so sounds, like Lampard in the 2010 World Cup? 2010, yeah, against Germany and South Africa. It's just so clear. So it's wide. worse, it's, isn't it? Lampard's was just over. That, oh, like, no, that was it. Yeah, Lampard's was... Was it yeah, much further? He'd come in and off the ball at the time. A, almost a yard, I would have thought. Although was, it might be exaggerating yeah. given the seven years that have yeah. elapsed in the meantime. But... You'd wonder, as Lineker says, why is goal line technology, given how successful it has been in the other leagues, how is it not in La Liga at the moment? I don't think it's going to cost Barcelona in the long run. They're still well set at the top of the table and drawing at the Mestalla against your closest pursuers wasn't the worst thing in the world. No, it's good to have Valencia back. It's good to have a few more teams to talk about when it comes to La Liga as well. Right, let's move on and uh, talk about our Saturday panel at the weekend. Nathan hosting on Saturday was uh, talking to a bunch of different people from the League of Ireland. Stewie Byrne was there, Shane Keegan uh, and uh, Bose commercial director Daniel Lambert was also there. They were talking specifically about the structure of the league and what needs to be done to help improve it. I think it's it's not in as bad a state as as Stewie paints there. I think there's one thing that was mentioned there. He's right in, in terms of people do uh, they go to games in the UK predominantly. Uh, I think a lot of that is down to to the marketing. Uh, the marketing of the Premier League is a model and, and a beast that you're not going to tackle. And I think the mistake is being made. I think too often and the FAI can do more and should do more, but too often the blame is placed for me at the hands of the FAI. The FAI should do this or they should do that. And as I said, th there are things they should do, but the clubs uh, have to look at themselves. I think we've over the last few years totally changed. Uh, our approach in terms of trying to get people to games, what we offer at games, uh, what the club is about as a club rather than as a team that play in the in the Artricity League, and I think that you know when when young people come to a game, you, you, there's no point in trying to tackle the Premier League head on because you just won't offer the, the you know the kind of the glamour, the the non-stop coverage that they offer. But there are things that the clubs can uh, can focus in on and begin to get people involved. And I think the biggest mistake the clubs have made is that they've isolated themselves. They've basically been about one team. They've They've neglected underage systems predominantly, the women's teams. They've neglected being about a broader club rather than just about a team. And um, they haven't made themselves relevant uh, to the areas that they're in. And that's what the GA and, and rugby do. They make themselves relevant. So if you look at uh, essentially Bohemians, and it's, you've more and more clubs, thankfully, in League of Ireland now are moving to members' own models. But we are essentially a GA club in structure. 
that play soccer. We're subcommittees and committees and we're all volunteers. So nobody earns a, a salary. And I was on the board of Bohemians for 10 years. I never earned a penny. It cost me money to do. And that's very similar to people I know that are in the GAA. Um, and if you look at a, you know, a, a local guy club hosts an event, everyone there is a volunteer. They're not paying people. And I think that's the mistake that, that a lot of clubs tried to professionalise in a way that was superficial. It was top heavy. And, uh, and I think You're a community, lot whereas a lot of clubs are almost turning their back on the community. Absolutely, yeah. Like we'd, and we may maybe talk about it later, but we, we had a, a strategic plan before the FAI, uh, before it kind of went public last year and the kind of uh, debacle about the strategic plans. But we put in that strategic plan, number one and two were interchangeable and they were community and football. And they, were, and they truly are interchangeable. Our, our work in the community is as important as our team on the pitch. And, um, you know, it was, it's something I think that's worth mentioning. For the first time this season, ourselves and Cork uh, got, got uh, EU funding from uh, the EU Regional Development Fund um, for our work in the communities. Uh, it's quite substantial funding over an 18 month period. How and much? That's, um, well, it's basically what it does is it employs two full time and one part time person per club okay. to work solely on community activities. And the thing about community work is that it's too often, again, in League of Ireland, it's linked to marketing. So the, the idea has been that you do work in the community to get people to come to your games. But people see tr right through that. You should do work in the community to do good in your community. And over time then, that trickles back and people get involved in the running of the club and volunteering, whether it's at your academy or your underwrite structures, and coming to games. And I think that's a key change that needs to happen. And it can be driven by the clubs themselves. Yeah, great stuff coming from the Saturday panel discussion there. You can get it on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts, uh, offtheball.com to subscribe as well. Uh, some of the comments coming through on Facebook, David Shocknessy says, Tide Burn will return next season to add to that second row depth. Suddenly we've got loads of uh, tight heads as well next season. Yeah, Marty Moore coming back as well. I wonder, is there any chance that Marty Moore could play for Ireland in the Six Nations now that he's demonstrate his, in, his intent to come back to play for Ireland. The absolute opposite end of the scale of Simon Zebo, who he still plays in Ireland, but has showed his intent to leave Ireland and he's out in the cold straight away. What do you think? No. I'd say no. <laughs> I'd say no. <laughs> it's like when you're, as soon as that plane touches down, oh, welcome back, come into the squad, but like while you're still there, no. Uh, Mark Joseph says, I'm watching in the Philippines, Mabuai. I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation, but uh, come on, Mark, and welcome to the show. Uh, supposedly, Castle Bar didn't have the password to get through the gate. <laughs> Is that true? I mean, I, that's believable. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's actually believable. I, I presume you're trolling us there. What's uh, the password, lads? Sarsfields. <laughs> they come out too early, apparently. Being told they come out too early. So what? Sure. It's written down. What was all. happening on the pitch at the time? There's a schedule, there's a schedule here. The gate. It could have been, could have been the, the local band. That was their time to shine. Well, there's no question. The fellow got his job done. He did the job he was asked to do, and you have to hand it to him for that. Uh, Monday Night Rugby tonight uh, on Off the Ball on News Talk is going to be Eddie O'Sullivan and Brian O'Driscoll looking back on the November Internationals, the football show. It's going to be Joe, Kevin, and Pat Nevin giving his thoughts uh, alongside from yesterday, alongside Dave in commentary as well. Much, much more as well. We're back tomorrow from 7.45 until 9 o'clock. Shane Stapleton is going to be joining us in studio. We're going to be chatting with Irish swimming superstar Mona McSharry in studio as well. But uh, thanks very much for being part of the show today. As ever, you can comment on the Facebook uh, post, facebook.com forward slash off the ball, twitter.com forward slash off the ball, instagram.com forward slash off the ball, or uh, whatever the last one is that I've left out, I can't even remember now, youtube.com forward slash off the ball.